Good morning. morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene. My name is Phyllis O'Neill, and I use the pronouns she and her, and I'm your worship associate this morning. We gather and worship to connect with each other and our beloved community, to find deeper meaning in our lives, and to live more fully and heartfully. Worship creates connections within, among, and beyond us all, calling us to our better selves, calling us to live with wisdom and compassion. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your image of the holy is, we're glad you're here. If this is your first time here today, we would love to welcome you uh, you're invited after the service to come to our welcome room, which is on the south side of the building. Uh, you'll see people gathered there. And that's right after the service. For those of you who are online, uh, a link is going to be dropped into the chat right now, and you can fill out the visitor form. You may have noticed that there's some QR codes uh, in various places within the building. And if you have a cell phone, you can copy that with your phone, and you'll get a copy of the order of service. Uh, that will tell you who is, uh, has written the songs and who the poets might be. We have large print copies for those of you who uh, need those. You can get them from the ushers. Now let's take a few minutes just to greet our neighbors, particularly those that you haven't met yet. So Kai is going to light our chalice for us this morning. Hi, Kai. Pulled in many directions by the demands of our days, we light this chalice to remind us of the still point deep inside. Made unsteady by the winds of unpredictable paths, we light this chalice to remember the shelter of each other. Longing for lights that lead us back to our truest selves, we light this chalice to illuminate the faces of friends and sacred companions, recalling once again that we find our way through the willingness to take each other's hands. And now, let us say together the words of our shared purpose. Powered by love, we transform ourselves and serve our world. I would like to win at soccer games, find a cure to cancer, live lively, depollute oceans with my friends, of, um, create a fundraiser for the homeless, notice global, global warming and try to stop it, decompose food, plant trees, eat food, go to culinary school, open a restaurant, um, see South Korea, um, accept people for who they are, go fishing, be excited for what lies ahead in archery. Hello, my name is Lee Wolf, um, and I'm 16 years old, and I use they, them pronouns. To most adults I know, 16 years is not a long life, but to someone who's living it, 16 years can feel like a millennia. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it feels like I've already done so much in my life. I have a schedule. I go to dance classes, I go to high school, and I spend my time with my friends and my family. It feels like time is slipping away from me. But when I talk to people, they say I have a whole life ahead of me. <laughs> and they ask me what I want to do with it. The answer is, I'm not entirely sure what I want to do with my life, but I know what I want it to be like. Right now, I'm just a teenager, which means I'm just starting to figure myself out. 
But I laugh in happiness, I cry in sadness, and I love in fullness, just like a child or an adult. My wild and precious life will be exactly what it's called, wild and precious. Life is meant to be wild, and so I have no plans to set a serious goal for myself when it comes to what I want to do with it. So in a way, the only thing I want from this wild and precious life is to embrace the wildness of it and to never forget how precious it all is. Well, I think we can go home now. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Good Sunday morning, everyone. I'm the Reverend Jen Young Sun Ru. I use the pronouns she and her. And I have the privilege and honor of serving this congregation as its minister. Since 1922, the Unitarians and later the Unitarian Universalists have invited distinguished persons to present the Ware Lecture at our annual General Assembly. This year, Dr. Imani Perry, professor and author, will join the list of notable speakers, including Martin Luther King Jr., Kurt Vonnegut, Shirley Chisholm, and in 2006, the poet Mary Oliver. Introducing the beloved poet, President Bill Sinkford pointed out the fact that our congregations probably use the words of Mary Oliver more than traditional religious texts. <laughs> he called her our most beloved liturgist. <laughs> For several years now, it has been the annual practice of this congregation to revisit one of her best loved poems, The Summer Day, as a way to hear from each other, members of this congregation, sharing what they think about their wild and precious life. And I hope that today's service will maybe inspire you to sign up next year to do the same thing. So in a moment, Phyllis and I are going to each take a microphone and we'll be on um, either side of the congregation. And we're going to ask for nine volunteers to read sections of this poem. And the sections will be projected on the screen. And um, if you're comfortable doing this, just raise your hand and we'll come to you, okay? So come, let the poet's words call you to consider the choices that you make about what you pay attention to in this moment, in this day, in this life. Come, let us worship together. Hello, hello. Okay, volunteers? Oh, we've already got one. Great. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to vault down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass. I don't know exactly, oops, <laughs> how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? 
Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Good morning. My name is Tina Dio, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm on the ministerial staff here at this church. And we are going to be entering into our time of joys and sorrows this morning. And I wanted to uh, give a shout out for a joy that we had um, Kathy Rex's birthday this past week. She turned 101 and she's on Zoom. So everybody turn around and wave on Zoom. Turn on the camera. Happy birthday, Kathy. Um, we celebrate you today and this week. So happy birthday. And so any, at any point during uh, the service, you can go over to our joys and sorrows table over here and write a prayer in the book. You can put a stone in the water. You can light a candle. And so at any point, please feel free to go over there. And those on Zoom, you can put your joys and sorrows in the chat and that will be open until the sermon time and also you can go on our website any point during the week and you can go and go on the pastoral care portal and find our lay pastoral associates our ministerial staff our kindness team and you can uh, contact any of them for any of your needs so as we um ponder our wild and precious lives. Let us enter into a time of meditation. And so I want you to close your eyes with me today and we will meditate on a perfect spring or summer day. We will meditate on all that we can sense. Some of us can see the insects, the grasshoppers, the plants, and animals around us. Some of us can hear the chirps of birds and the wind blowing through the trees. Some of us can touch the earth, grass, and plants. Imagine feeling that grass between your fingers. We can lay down in the grass and feel the warmth of the sun, or if it's raining, feel the rain falling on our body. If there's a berry or an apple tree near us, we might even be able to taste spring and summer. Some of us can smell all the things in bloom and if it's raining, smell the petrichor emanating off the grass and streets. We can sit in this perfect spring or summer day and breathe in and breathe out and be grateful for our life. We can think about that question Mary Oliver posed to us. What do you plan to do with your wild and precious life? Or what have you already done with your wild and precious life? And what more do you want to do? And maybe the answer is you want to live life with all of your senses, soaking up the rain and sun, the struggle and the joy, the tears and the laughter, and all the marvelous colors that come with a life rooted to this precious earth. Breathe in and breathe out. May it be so, amen. Sometimes when I think about how short the human lifespan really is, I feel anxious, almost terrified. But short is relative, I suppose, 
I mean, compared with what? That of a grasshopper? That of the black bear? The life of this planet? This feeling of panic hits me when my mind churns up doubts about how I have wasted my time, squandered the gift of days, how I have not used these precious weeks wisely and well, and when I die, how I will leave so many things undone and unfinished and unseen. You know, I've been a time management um, enthusiast for a really long time. <laughs> Ever since high school when I got my first trapper keeper. <laughs> Child of the 80s, <laughs> 90s. Oh, they were still there in the 90s? Okay. <laughs> in my first professional job, I was a devotee of Stephen Covey and the Franklin Planner. And since then, I've latched on to um, the bullet journal, as the staff knows, <laughs> time blocking, habit stacking, and all of these things, of course, are tactical tools, right? Helpful at one level, but not really getting to the essential, deeper questions of what constitutes a meaningful and purposeful life. When I stop long enough to listen to deep wisdom, I see that I'm often operating on top of a limiting story. And this is what my version of that limiting story sounds like. After I clear out my inbox, after I get to the very last email, then I can go outside and play like Mary Oliver. After I retire, then I can hike the Pacific Crest Trail. After I rearrange my art space, then I can create something truly beautiful. Way back in 1910, when life was getting faster and faster and when trains and cars expanded the geographic range and physical range of humans, an Englishman named Arthur Bennett wrote a tiny book entitled, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. Innumerable souls are haunted by the feeling, he writes, that the years slip by and slip by and slip by and that they have not yet been able to get their lives in proper order. Bennett compares the fate of two people. Both desire to fulfill their religious vows by going to Mecca. One sets out, unprepared, uncertain, but following the desires of their heart. This one may never reach Mecca. This one may drown before getting to Port Said. This one may perish on the coast of the Red Sea. And those desires may remain eternally frustrated. But this person's unfilled, unfulfilled aspirations will most likely not torment them in the same way as the second person. The second one has the same desire, but stressed out about the details of the trip and all the complexities of the planning and everything that needs to be done before setting out never actually leaves home. The second person does not need a better time management system. <laughs> this issue is not a matter of finding a better tactical 
strategy or something like that, but it is a matter of facing the reality of our finite nature. The world, the universe is vast, and so its offerings are limitless. And we are so small. Our lives are short, and we will die with much left unfinished because there is no bottom to the email box. <laughs> How then are we to live as finite creatures in a world of infinite possibilities? The poet's answer is to pay attention. Pay attention, which is her understanding of prayer, to fall down in the grass, to kneel down in the grass, to be idle and to be blessed. We have been blessed this morning by hearing from speakers from the first decade, living their first decade of their lives, the second decade of their lives, the fifth decade, and the ninth decade. So we'll hear from our next speaker, Jill Switzer. Good morning. Uh, just to set the record straight, I'm not quite in the fifth decade yet. <laughs> uh, and also, um, I don't believe I've had a midlife crisis until being tasked with this assignment. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, a person that likes structure, and I, I really struggled with trying to find how to condense 47 years um, into one to two minutes. And, and so I decided to turn to a, what's called an acrostic poem. Maybe some of you know what that is. And but just to explain quickly, um, I took wild and precious life, the first letter of uh, each of those words, to write something. So, for example, W from wild is, what have I already done with my wild and precious life? Introspection does not come easily. Listen to the wisdom of others and ask, do I need or even want 47 more years? All of these things have been a part of my life and or I hope to achieve in the time I have left. Noticing what needs to be done and taking action. Dancing to the music freely and with unabashed delight. Planting seeds, trees, flowers, and kindness. Remembering the past and learning from it. Embracing the challenges of being a mom and a spouse. Cultivating friendships near and far intelligent, thoughtful conversations, openness to what lies ahead, uniting what divides us, singing in a choir, singing in a community, singing with my students, loving family, my husband, two kids, my parents, two brothers, in-laws, nieces, and nephews, the list goes on. Incorporating gratitude into interactions. Finding beauty and insight in different cultures. Enjoying each day at a time with whatever remains of my wild and precious life. And I've said so many nice things about under-ministers today. Uh, 
I'm Nisko Jenkins. I'm one sixteenth black, but I have straight hair. I identify as being black. I have pretty straight hair, and I'm light skinned. Uh, I go by she and her. I'm going to tell you my adoption story. And those of you who spent any time, 15, 20 minutes with me, you probably heard the story, but that's okay. You're going to hear it again. Uh, my brother in 1944 was nine years old. My soon-to-be brother was nine years old. And he went to my mother and father, and he told them that he wanted a baby sister. And my parents... My father had a wonderful sense of humor and said, go look in the Montgomery Court catalog. If you're from the Midwest, they didn't have malls in those days. If whatever you want was in the Montgomery catalog. So my brother looked in the catalog, but he couldn't find a baby sister. He went to my register, and there was an article, and I tried to bring it, but it's as old as I've been, and he's thrown them away. It said, Muggsy needs a home. And so they brought it, he brought it to my mother and father. And they thought that was awfully cute. And they decided to take care of it. So they, they called the chancellor's office and they called the orphanage. Evidently, there was some relative of my family who hadn't wanted to give me up. So they called weekly and then my mother called daily. If you know my mother, that's where she was. Finally, on February 1st, they got a call from the chancellor's office, and they said she can, they could come and get her, me on the second, the next day. But they said she doesn't like anyone, and she can't walk, and she can't talk. You're not going to want her. My mother and father got on a bus from Bloomfield, Iowa. It's about 100 miles on the bus, and went to Des Moines, took a cab, to the orphanage, the Christ Child Orphanage. When they got there, they heard the same song and dance. She doesn't like anyone, she doesn't talk, she doesn't walk, you're not gonna want her. And my mother said, well, let me, let me just look at her, let us just see her. So there was a room with 25 baby beds. I know the story because my mother often told it so. There were 25 baby beds. And in one of those baby beds, I was laying. And my mother walked over to that bed. And I said, oh, mommy. And she picked me up in her brown hands and loved me for the rest of my life. And she took me home, and they loved me and took care of me. I was very lucky. Yeah, I have a picture. I'm about a year old here. And they'd had me, I mean, about a year, a year with them. My father, my mother, and me. You know, the, the line that makes, that brings us with the rest of the service is, doesn't everything die? Thank you. And too soon, when I was in my 40s, my mother died. And that was the most difficult thing I'd ever experienced. She'd always been there. How can she die? And now, I had a Catholic upbringing, so give me a moment. I decided, even though I'm a Unitarian, I still believe in heaven. While I'm on earth, I carry my mother and father and my brother in my heart. When I get to heaven, and you get there, I will introduce you as the UUAs who have loved me so much in this world. Let's go. I don't know what prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention. The majority of the people on earth probably don't have the privilege to spend a day in a grassy field like Mary Oliver did but we can all pay attention. We can all pay attention to whatever is right in front of us rather than what has already passed 
or worrying about what might happen tomorrow. In one sense, attention is all we have. It is our life. At the end, our life will be the tally of everything that held our attention, the relationships that we cultivated with our love, the vocation we nurtured with growth and development and education, the spiritual life that we attended to with daily practices, weekly worship, and moment-to-moment -moment mindfulness. So, what compels your attention these days? What is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Friends, it has been a long, cold winter. <laughs> Thankfully, the wheel of the year has turned, and once more, the door has opened and invited us to rebirth and renewal and regeneration. So rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. <laughs> The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard on the land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Amen, and blessed be. has the sole power and authority to do just a few things. One is choose their own minister, two, ordain a brand new minister, and three, perform the act of installation. And so I hope that you will come back at three o'clock this afternoon for our installation service. Now let's say together the words of our closing. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now, my friends, go forth through the open door of this new season. Soar with courage ever high. Touch the earth. Reach the sky. Go in love, my friends. Go in peace.